Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now we don't know, you see, whether David wrote this psalm when he was an old man or when he was a young man. Some people think he wrote it at the end of his life, looking back over God's goodness to him on his pilgrim journey, anticipating the day of his death. It might well be. I rather think, however, that he wrote it as a teenager, when he was just a bit of a boy out there on the Judean hill, with his flocks around him, looking at the sheep. All of a sudden, this tremendous, this tremendous truth dawned upon him. The Lord is my shepherd. There's no reason, you see, why he couldn't have written it as a teenager. I like to picture David, you know, as a, as a boy going down into the valley of Elah, to come to grips with Goliath of Gath, to destroy him that had the power of death. And I see him as he goes down into the valley, and as he goes he sings, and as he sings he says, Yea, though I walk in death's dark veil, yet will I fear no ill, for thou art with me, and thy rod and staff me comfort still. He takes us, first of all, out onto the glen. You see the pasture lands dotted with his father's sheep. And then he takes us down into the gorge, towering cliffs on every side, and raging torrent far below. And then he takes us on over into the glory. In the first part of this lovely little Hebrew hymn, David talks about our frailty. In the second part of the hymn, he talks about our foes. At the end of the psalm, he talks about our future. It has its roots in a magnificent spiritual relationship. David says, he says, the Lord is my shepherd. Now that's one of the greatest names for God, you see. If you have a King James Bible, you'll notice that the word Lord is written in capital letters. That's just a typographical way of telling you that it's really the, the, the name Jehovah. What he's actually saying is, Jehovah is my shepherd. The Jews had such a ceremonial reverence, such a superstitious fear of taking the name of Jehovah, their God, in vain. They changed the name to Adonai, Lord. And whenever you see that word Lord in the Old Testament in capitals, it's just another way of saying it's really the name Jehovah. The God who is, the God who was, the God who ever is to be. 
the God who doesn't dwell like we do in three tenses of time. He dwells in the eternal present tense. You see, when we express our mode of being, we say, I was, I am, I will be. God doesn't say that. God says, I am, I am, I am. <laughs> he dwells in the eternal present tense. And David, just a teenage lad, he'd caught a hold of this tremendous truth. He said he's the absolutely inescapable one. He's always there. And he, the one who dwells in the eternal present tense of time, he is my shepherd. Magnificent spiritual relationship. It's not sufficient, is it, to know that the Lord is the great shepherd of the sheep? That he's the good shepherd. It makes all the difference in the world when you can say the Lord is my shepherd. The secret of a satisfied life I shall not want. The secret of a saved life he restoreth. He brings back my soul. The secret of a spiritual life he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. Secret of a secured life for his namesake. Oh, he's not going to let us down, you know. His name's tied up in it. Thinks too much of his name ever to let us down. Magnificent spiritual resources. He brings back my soul, said David, thinking of the many, many times He'd done just that for a poor lost sheep. Up from the mountains, thunder-riven, up from the rocky steep, there arose a cry to the gates of heaven. Rejoice, I have found my sheep. And the angels echoed around the throne. Rejoice, for the Lord brings back his own. Oh, he says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. I'm sure you must have noticed the change in the personal pronoun. Up until now, he's been talking about him. He, he maketh me to lie down. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. It's for his name's sake. He's been talking about the shepherd. But when he comes into the valley, he changes the personal pronoun. It's no longer he and him. It's thou art with me. You see, he's no longer talking about the shepherd. He's now talking to the shepherd. The shepherd all of a sudden has drawn near in that dark valley of shadows. He says, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. You'll notice, the, the, of course, that he calls it the valley of the shadow of death. Well, a shadow can't hurt you. The shadow of a sword can't kill. The shadow of a dog can't bite. The shadow of death can't hurt you. It's only the valley of the shadow of death. But you see, where you have a shadow, you must have two other things. In order to have a shadow, you must have a substance, and you must have a light. It is the light shining on the substance that casts the shadow. So when David speaks about the valley of the shadow of death in Psalm 23, it's because he has already talked about the valley of the substance of death in Psalm 22. The substance of death. Something Jesus tasted on the cross of Calvary. When he cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 
That's the substance of death. To be finally abandoned by God forever. For God to say at last, you didn't want me. You didn't want my son. You didn't want my word. You didn't want my people. You didn't want my Holy Spirit. Have it your own way. Depart from me, ye cursed, I never knew you. And to be abandoned by God forever. That's the substance of death. That's what Jesus tasted on the cross. When he who knew no sin was made sin for us. That's the substance of death. But you see, where you have a shadow, you not only have a substance, you have a light. Can't have a shadow without a light. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. That's the great difference between the death of somebody who can say, the Lord is my shepherd, and the death of somebody who never knew the shepherd. When an unbeliever dies, he goes out into the dark. And the Bible speaks of the blackness of darkness forever. But when a Christian dies, he goes out into the light. Paul puts it like this, absent from the body, present with the Lord. You open your eyes and gaze into the face of your loved one. You close them. You open them again and look straight into the face of Jesus. Thy rod and thy staff, he said, they comfort me. Now I often wondered what David meant when he talked about the rod and the staff comforting him in the hour of death. He'd faced death many times. He'd faced death at the hands of that lion. He'd faced death at the hands of a bear. Shortly he was to go down into the valley and face death at the hands of Goliath. Oh, he said, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I thought to myself, how ever does a rod and a staff comfort somebody in the hour of death? Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Well, what does he mean when he talks about thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me? Well, you see, he's talking about his death, isn't he? And his mind has gone back to the exodus. The great exodus. He's thinking of his exodus. And he's, he's thinking also of the exodus of the children of Israel. And you remember how they came to the Red Sea. And what does Moses have in his hand? He has a rod and a staff. That rod, he waved with the rod and the waters parted. And the, the children of Israel, three or four million of them, marched past him. He stood there with the rod and the staff in his one hand and in his other. And the, 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 the staff said, you're a pilgrim people. You're only passing through. The rod was there for the enemy. When the very last one was safely on the other side, he took that rod and dealt with the enemy. Oh, says David, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Amen. Secret of a happy life. The secret of a happy death. The secret of a happy eternity. Yea, he says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Everywhere we go, goodness and mercy. Everywhere we go. Then he says, I shall dwell 
in the house of the Lord forever. Oh, just think of that. I shall dwell in the Lord for a thousand years. Oh, dear me, no, it doesn't say that, does it? I shall dwell in the Lord for a million years. Oh, no, you'd just be getting your harp in tune by then. <laughs> I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I suppose one of the greatest preachers ever to be raised up in Scotland was John Knox. Brought revival to Scotland. Left his mark upon Scotland to this very day. Born in 1505. Died November 24th. 1572. It is said that Mary Queen of Scots was more afraid of John Knox than she was of all the armies of England. Man of iron, one of God's champions. He was dying and his servants and friends gathered around his bed and they asked him as he crossed over Jordan if he still had the hope of glory if it was well with him in the valley would he give them a sign and the poet tells us what happened grim in his deep death anguish the stern old champion lay and the locks upon his pillow were floating thin and gray and visionless and voiceless with quick and labored breath he waited for his exit through life's dark portal death hast thou the hope of glory they bowed to catch the thrill that through some languid token might be responsive still. Nor watched they long, nor waited for some obscure reply. He raised a clay-cold finger and pointed to the sky. Thus the deaf angel found him what time he came that way to loose the struggling spirit from hampering bonds of clay. Thus the deaf angel left him, what time earth's bonds were riven, a cold, stark, stiffening finger, still pointing up to heaven. A happy eternity. Every so often, your friends wish you a happy new year. The Holy Spirit wishes you a happy eternity.